Thank you. All right. Well, welcome. Um, hello. We are very. Amazing. Okay. Educate healthcare and technical professionals as well as students to innovate with AR and VR in healthcare. And our mission is to increase the number of AR, VR healthcare prototypes created each year and to increase the size of the interdisciplinary community of innovators. And once a year, MedVR will convene a healthcare themed hackathon in AR and VR in order to provide a practicum for the community and, and to measure the educational outcome. Today, we have a very exciting topic to talk about with outstanding panelists. We are going to talk about living health, living heart project, I'm sorry, creating the heartbeat of the virtual world. Our panelists are Stephen Levine, David Hoganson, and Noah Schultz. Dr. Steve Levine is the head of virtual human modeling for Dassault System, bringing more than 30 years of experience in the development of modeling and simulation software. He is the founder and executive director of the Living Heart Project, which is a global collaboration to develop personalized digital human heart models. Dr. Levine was elected into the College of Fellows in an American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering and holds a PhD in material science and engineering from Rutgers University. He began his career in health tech at the San Diego based startup Biostim Technologies that went public as a Celeris in 2004 and acquired by Dassault System in 2014. I would also like to introduce you uh, to introduce Dr. Hoganson. He's an assistant in cardiac surgery Department of Cardiac Surgery at Boston Children's Hospital, and he is an instructor of surgery at Harvard Medical School. His clinical focus is in neonates and children with congenital heart disease. He has co-lead development of patient-specific 3D modeling and computational flow modeling of complex cardiac disease for improved preoperative planning and intraoperative guidance. His lab also focuses on development of medical devices to improve the safety and effectiveness of cardiac surgery. Dr. Hoganson has a background in engineering and industry experience, developing cardiovascular medical devices even prior to medical school. He graduated from the Temple University School of Medicine in 2004 and completed his general surgery residency and cardiothoracic fellowship at Washington University in St. Louis and completed a congenital cardiac surgery fellowship at the Boston Children's Hospital in 2016. Unfortunately, he's tied up in the OR at the moment, but he will uh, be able to join us shortly. Uh, Noah Schultz is also will be with us today and he has a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Boston University where his research focused in, on acoustic imaging. After several years of large-scale environmental modeling for the FAA and National Park Service, he joined Boston Children's Hospital to build medical simulators and 3D printed anatomical models. He has focused on cardiac modeling since 2014, and as a senior en engineer in the Hammer Hoganson lab at uh, Boston Children's Hospital Heart Center is leading efforts to use digital anatomical models across the center for patient education, device design, intraoperative navigation, and beyond. So um, very exciting topics, very exciting, um, outstanding panelists. Again, we are all ready to hear your amazing topic. Great, thanks, Oceanus. Let me just share my screen. And I'll lead off today. Let me know. We can see your screen very well. Okay. Fantastic, excellent, thanks. So, so first I wanna thank Oceanus and, and everyone from the MedVR organization for uh, allowing uh, me and my team here to 
share the work we've been doing. It's um, very exciting work. I think we're living in very interesting times. Uh, my focus has been on um, the lead of a project. Uh, as Oceanus pointed out, I'm the head of virtual human modeling and our uh, flagship activity was really something I called the Living Heart Project. And I'm going to take you through kind of the journey that I've been on uh, and I'll, I'll share uh, the work that I've been doing within the project and also uh, Dr. Hoganson and, and uh, Noah will share the work that they've been doing. So let me start a little bit by introducing uh, just quickly my company. Uh, so Dassault Systems is a scientific company. We do scientific software, a uh, fairly large company, been around for 40 years or so. Uh, we began really helping companies like from the aerospace industry and automotive industry build very complex machines that require uh, many people to come together into a final operational machine that all has to work uh, safely and effectively uh, every time. And of course, uh, doing that with physical prototypes is very costly and time consuming. And so the concept of the digital twin was really to develop to allow these companies uh, to be able to first build it on the computer and then translate it into the real world. Uh, and um, that's a very effective, and I'll take you through a little bit of the history of that. Uh, the concept of the digital twin, uh, you can see it graphically down here at the, at the bottom. Uh, it's really about capturing what happens in the real world and then replicating it into the virtual world so that you can study it in far more detail. You can interrogate it. And by capturing that detail in, in uh, all the, the elements and then bringing the laws of nature and what we know about how materials, et cetera, behave, uh, you can actually replicate it and then improve it. And so I'll take you through how we've been doing that. Uh, the founding principle is something uh, that we call computer-aided engineering. It's really bringing physical behavior into virtual, uh, the virtual uh, object. Uh, so of course, this community is very familiar with virtual objects, uh, 3D representations that allow you to experience the virtual world. And we bring uh, not just combining it with the real world as traditional augmented reality, but we actually give it physical properties. So we break it down into small elements and these elements can be put together and then you can study how the entire object behaves by understanding how the small piece will behave. So here's a simple example of uh, just being able to show how something might shatter uh, under pressure and with modern computers, you can actually build up an entire automobile using all of these small, tiny little parts. And so this is a virtual car. This car didn't exist when it was built and we can uh, see exactly what happens to the car when it crashes and you can see what happens inside. You can see how to design the engine so it bends below and doesn't crush the feet of the passenger, et cetera. The, Modeling goes beyond the automobile. Of course, we care about passenger safety. Here's an example of how uh, the dummy, of course, we all see crash dummies. And on the right is the, is the physical dummy, the real dummy. On the left is the virtual twin. And you can see by systematically understanding how each of the pieces of that uh, dummy works, we can actually replicate the behavior. And then we can put it all together into a virtual reality uh, center and here using high performance visualization you can actually see and utilize all of the senses that I know you're all familiar with the power of creating a realistic environment means that we can interpret uh, uh, the information that the computer is providing us with far greater detail and use all of our senses. Um, in fact you can then look at uh, different views you have it on the virtual car you can see what happens I don't know how well this comes through the Zoom, but you can actually see the shock waves being transmitted through. And this is all virtual. This car doesn't exist. You can peel away the metal uh, and you can see exactly what happens inside and you can optimize how these things go. And so now um, virtually 99% of all uh, automotive tests are done, uh, crash tests are done on the computer. And then they finally build the final prototype uh, when it's all the way done. In fact, in 2013, uh, way back seven years ago, 
uh, BMW came to one of our conferences and presented that they no longer have to build a physical prototype, that they can actually use the computer model and then go right to production and then test the production. Uh, a couple of years later, Airbus say, said the same thing about a plane. So we have made great progress in those uh, areas and we can visualize and see great detail. But I wondered when I looked at what was happening in the medical field, there was such a difference. There was such a strong gap between the, the quality of the representations in the automotive world and the quality of the representation for the medical field. And I wondered about what was the cap? Why is it that consumers demand safe cars, but we're not applying the same technology and giving them to our doctors and our medical biomedical engineers? Um, they're really stuck, um, we're very much stuck behind. And I wondered if that was a technology or a sociological thing. Was it really just a challenge because the knowledge to build uh, of the human body, uh, and we began with the human heart uh, for a number of different reasons, not least of which heart disease remains the number one cause of death worldwide. Uh, so no matter how much progress we seem to be making, uh, we're not getting ahead of the problem. And so we thought that would be a great place to start. And we knew uh, that the knowledge and people have been studying the heart for years. Researchers have been studying it and creating models and capturing information. And uh, of course the engineers are building devices and, and hoping to and solve these problems. And uh, of course clinicians are observing the behavior and seeing and understand how it reacts. And of course the regulators ultimately uh, are the arbiters of whether or not we believe we understand how something is gonna behave. Uh, and so wondered if we could bring all of those pieces together, taking the fragments of knowledge that everybody has in their individual domain and got everybody to work together on a common representation, did we actually know enough to build an entire human heart? Uh, was the information out there, but scattered in the minds and hard drives of all this community? Um, and if we did, uh, just like you could do uh, in those uh, mechanical analogs, you could then use it to create new devices, study drugs, help accelerate the regulatory process, and then eventually translate uh, into clinical practice. And so that was really the origin uh, and the inspiration behind the Living Heart Project. Uh, so back in 2014, I launched the project with a mission to bring together all of these different communities uh, to use virtual reality, uh, the organ, in this case, the heart as the common language between scientists and engineers and doctors, they could all agree on the physical, the visible representation. And then once we could create these models that they would be validated uh, by the clinicians, then we could use it to advance treatments and then ultimately translate that into care. Uh, and we'll talk about the journey that we've been on uh, with the project uh, today. So, so rather than go to the literature, uh, I actually went to the experts in all these domains. To build a heart, you have to start with the fundamentals. Uh, we have to get the shape of the heart rebuilt from MRI and CT scans. So we know we have a realistic geometry. Uh, we have to then impart the physical characteristic tissue models, the detailed fibers that actually control the muscle contractions. Uh, you have to get the, the fibers exactly right, otherwise you won't get the response uh, that's really critical to the behavior of the heart. It has to be coupled to an electrical system, we need valves, and all of this expertise. Fortunately, back then, uh, you could actually fly, uh, and I could go and, and actually bring these experts together to work on this common representation, a system model, so we actually have the lungs and, and the entire body represented uh, around the heart. And when we brought all those pieces together, it actually turned out uh, we could build a functioning human heart. Uh, and so very rapidly, we were able to actually take these pieces that had been scattered around and bring them together to show we actually knew enough to build a human heart. And again, I don't know how well the visualization will come across, but we can apply high performance visualization. And now you can actually see um, in detail what's happening the muscle contractions, how it behaves, and you can actually then interrogate it in more detail. Uh, and now we can allow doctors to use their intuition that they would ordinarily get 
by opening the chest of a patient, but by doing that in the virtual world because it behaves just like the real heart. So the living heart model uh, is actually multiple models. We have an electrical model that works just like nature. It stimulates the heart uh, through the Purkinje network and conductivity through the tissue. Uh, it then stimulates the, the um, muscles which contract and then drive the blood flow. And with all of that in place, uh, you can now study things. I'll give you a very quick example. One of the first things we did uh, was brought to us by uh, a group trying to create a standard for a pacemaker lead. Pacemaker lead is the, the wire that connects the electrical device that stimulates the heart. So if the heart's not pacing properly, you actually uh, give it a shock and it, uh, and it stimulates the heart for you. And these wires can break because they're metal. And of course that's bad. So the question is, if we have these virtual hearts that are actually physically mechanical, we can put those wires inside and actually see what happens to them. And we know how to calculate whether metal will bend or break. Uh, as you can tell, we can do that. Uh, we learned it for decades of experience in uh, other industries. So could we apply that? Um, we created an automatic technique then to create what we called an in silico clinical trial. We created a population of patients representative of, of what we believe would be the population. Ultimately, um, the goal was to fine tune a real population, sort of enrich the population so that we can identify which patients would be the one that would create the greatest risk to fracture. And by doing that, you could shrink the population down enough to make it cost effective, make the measurements, and then establish the standards. And we were successful in being able to do that. Uh, and on the right, you can see some ideas. You can see the graph here of uh, actual, uh, in this case, we're looking at curvature as an indication of, of fatigue potential. And you can see there are actually multiple points because the inside cavity is not uniform. And there were actually multiple points. This is information that was not uh, readily available. Uh, and so you have the graphs, but more importantly, you can actually take this and look at it, uh, in this case, using augmented reality in a tablet where we can actually superimpose, and this is just four different uh, incarnations with different attachment points, with different slack lengths, and we color code it by the, the actual uh, stress that's on the fatigue. And immediately, if you hand that to a surgeon, uh, they know how to interpret that and they can tell exactly what's best to do. Uh, and of course we have the numerics behind it to support it. So with this heart model in place, I don't have time to go through all of the different examples, but the community uh, that has come together around the living heart uh, has used the model for looking at valves, uh, uh, valve treatments, uh, artificial stents, left ventricular assist devices, studying heart disease, et cetera, all kinds of techniques, looking at blood flow, hemodynamics. Essentially, uh, so far, we've been able to find a way to study pretty much every therapeutic area. Uh, and when we have a challenge, uh, we actually reach out to see if there's an expert out in the world who can help us solve that problem. And incrementally, as we use uh, the heart model to uh, identify further and further therapeutics. We make it better with each one and the community tests it. And every time we improve it, the community then say, well, if you can, uh, if you can represent heart failure, can we cure the heart failure? Uh, and the different groups can come together. And all of this is then of course represented uh, and, and I don't have to tell you the importance of actually visualizing what's happening. So because we have this realistic uh, visual heart, we're able to build uh, a complete immersive cave uh, in, in our headquarters in Paris and in Boston. You can walk inside uh, the heart and see exactly what's happening. It's really fantastic. Uh, you can look at it on these augmented reality systems. We've gotten a lot of positive response from this holographic tablet. So this is, you, you don't need goggles, just polarized lenses and you can see the heart beating right in front of you is a hologram. You can interact with it. You can use a webcam and do virtual teleconferencing. So you can actually have a doctor performing surgery on the virtual heart 
uh, through the web and have someone observing it. So you can see exactly what the surgeon is doing uh, all broadcast throughout the world. And so a fantastic way to think about training and education. So um, as I said, uh, our hope is to create a model that really replicates life. And so going beyond devices, uh, we thought about how we could use the same model to study drug interactions. Uh, the first study we did was actually looking at cardiotoxicity, uh, something called prolonged QT, which is a delay in the conductivity uh, of the heart through the, the network. And that can be very disastrous. Uh, there's, there's a range of uh, problems where you just uh, have a lower heart rate. And if it gets to a certain level, uh, it goes into a complete arrhythmia, uh, something called torsade de point, and that can be fatal. Uh, and this prolonged QT is actually the number one reason all drugs fail in their clinical trial, whether it's a heart or not. If, it, um, if the drug has the effect of prolonging the QT, it's almost immediately kicked out of a trial. And that can be 10, 15 years into development only to find out it has this one phenomenon. So the idea is, could we study what happens, what the drug does at the level of, of the ions that are that are actually controlling the conductivity. So here we see a beta channel. We've all heard of beta blockers who actually block the ion moving through the channel. And it's those ions that actually uh, perform the conductivity. Could we scale that all the way up to actually look at what happens from the drug to the EKG? And so we built the version of our heart model uh, that could actually do that. A complete multi-scale model that went from the drug to the channel all the way to be able to predict the EKG and not only uh, look at the effect of electrical system, but now we could actually look and see what's happening to the heart. Uh, so we can tell far more detail about what's happening to the patient than just prolonged QT. We can actually understand what's happening to the hemodynamics and the location uh, because these are not uniform. And so we were able to build virtual patients and all this work is published. Uh, we could go automatically by introducing, for example, heart failure, uh, have a control, a synthetic patient, a, um, give the patient the treatment, and spontaneously we found that drugs that were known to cause uh, these arrhythmias would spontaneously put our heart into arrhythmia. Uh, so we're able to believe that we're actually doing a pretty good job of representing uh, nature. We could study dosage, so you could identify safe dosage, and this can really help from a regulatory perspective. Okay, and of course you can um, drill down because we have this model and you can actually see what the drug is doing and get insights all the way down to the fine detail. Uh, the last example that I'd like to share uh, is the work we're doing uh, with the, on the regulatory side. As I mentioned, uh, what's key to this project to not only have scientists, engineers, and practitioners, but the gatekeepers, the regulatory team, be able to assess this technology to see if we can facilitate uh, the use of virtual patients uh, to hopefully augment or replace real patients and animals in studies. So if we can systematically build better and better virtual models, the same way uh, car companies can use virtual cars, can we get to the point where we only need 1% of the patients to be real patients and the rest to be virtual patients. And so, uh, so we set out with this idea of a, to expand on this idea of an in silico clinical trial uh, to address the key problem that when you're developing a new therapeutic, you go through many, many years of testing to get to the point where you can first put it in a human environment. That first in human is so important. You learn more than you learn the entire rest of the time. And then you find out you have to go back and make changes. And this is costly and very um, uh, takes a very long time and often can uh, derail the entire process. And small companies can't recover from uh, sometimes what happens in those first in human tests. So the idea is if we could accelerate that and get a first in virtual human, uh, do that right up front, do all your work on the computer, build a virtual therapeutic, put it into a virtual cynical in silico clinical trial, and then you could actually uh, iterate. And then by the time you actually put it into uh, physical testing, 
in human clinical trials, you have a pretty good understanding of what's going to happen. So there's no surprises and everything happens faster. So this idea, uh, as I said, we've been working with the FDA since the start. Uh, this was picked up. In fact, the, um, the director of the CDRH, Jeff Sheeran, uh, sponsors this project that we're doing with them to actually create a in silico clinical trial for a heart um, a heart valve device uh, to create to use the living heart pro, uh, living heart model as a virtual patient population and to see if we could actually do what we said uh, and the FDA signed a five year collaborative agreement specifically to help us build what they what he called actually the medical device review of the future how we combine the virtual world and the real world to get the best of both uh, and to really accelerate and bring these technologies as fast as possible. So again, I don't have time to go into detail. Uh, this is actually the device we're going to uh, bring through this clinical trial. Uh, we're working on a mitral valve, uh, a, uh, a mitral valve um, repair device. So there are very few treatments for mitral valve disease or fewer than um, have been approved than really are needed to service the population. And so we hope to be able to build uh, a regulatory grade model of, of mitral valve to really help um, not only help the FDA and the community understand how to interpret this data, but actually how to accelerate getting these devices to market. And because we're working using the living heart model, we actually, um, convened a, a collaborative group, a special interest group that have all come together to help build a special a version, an advanced version of the, of the mitral valve model that's parametric so we can automatically scale it to an entire population, uh, something that's never really been done before. And so with this, we can really accelerate, hopefully, uh, this translation. Now, speaking of translation, uh, the really important part, uh, I'll turn over to my colleagues about showing how this technology is not just show, is not just sitting in the researcher's laboratory, but these models are now making their way and being used in the clinical environment to actually save lives. And so to tell you the work that we're doing uh, collaboratively, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. David Hoganson and Noah Schultz will talk about the work they're doing at Boston Children's Hospital uh, using these methods. Noah? Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, uh, Oceanus, and everyone for uh, having us today. Um, Dr. Hoganson, as far as I know, is still in the operating room, but we pre-recorded his uh, brief presentation that I'm going to play now, um, and we're hopeful that he may be able to join us uh, shortly, but uh, I'm going to play this, and hopefully the audio works and everything's uh, smooth, but here's uh, Dr. Hoganson. Within the spectrum of congenital heart disease, there is tremendous variation, both in the anatomy of the disease and the physiology. Decision-making in many complex cases from clinical experience alone is simply not enough to always know the best course of treatment or exactly how to reconstruct a heart to achieve an optimal outcome. Even though the cardiovascular system is complex and there are biological underpinnings to its intricate function, understanding how to repair congenital heart disease is fundamentally a physics problem. At Boston Children's Hospital, we have put together an engineering team that utilizes proven modeling and simulation tools from industry to really change the paradigm on how several heart defects are visualized, procedures are planned, and operations are conducted. The impact of this effort has been reaching in that these methods are now part of the standard practice in the care of many patients. And yet, we know we are only scratching the surface of what is possible with these techniques. Fundamental to our progress has been a partnership with the SO Systems to extend many of the tools and platforms that are indispensable in aerospace and other fields and apply them to the challenging engineering problems that we face. One of our senior engineers, Noah Schultz, is gonna take over in a minute 
and walk us through the workflow that we currently use to generate patient-specific 3D models. We have established a consultation service for our heart center where physicians can request patient-specific 3D models to be created. These models are shared on a web platform with the surgeons and cardiologists. In selected patients, we utilize the Dassault 3D Experience platform to virtually perform surgeries in coordination with the surgeon. We utilize computational fluid dynamics on these models to predict the post-operative blood flow and hemodynamics. This has been a terrific tool to manage some of the most complex single ventricle patients that we see. We also utilize these 3D models on a 2D screen in the operating room for interoperative guidance. We have modeled over 110 clinical patients over the last two years. We are thrilled to now be embarking on the utilization of virtual reality for aspects of preoperative planning in these patients, particularly for the planning of complex intracardiac procedures in children, giving the surgeon the perspective of standing inside the heart allows them to visualize the anatomy and plan the intervention at a whole nother level. We have done this to a limited degree to date, and we are building on our experiences. We are collaborating with Julie Lamone to expand our virtual reality applications. We are excited to work towards a platform where this is utilized regularly in complex cases to better define our operative plan. All right, so uh, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, I am, uh, my name is Noah Schultz. I'm a mechanical engineer uh, at Boston Children's. And uh, I'm just gonna talk to you a little bit about the work that we've been doing. Um, as Steven said, the uh, clinical applications for this kind of work are many, but it can be a little difficult to get engineers into the clinic. However, uh, at Boston Children's Hospital, we've built a, a team of engineers that work really as closely as you possibly can with clinicians to use engineering tools to help solve clinical problems. And so the Heart Center has supported us in building this lab led by David Hoganson and Pete Hammer, who's a PhD mechanical engineer and biomedical engineer who's been at Children's Hospital working on cardiac modeling for about 20 years. Um, as, uh, as Oceana said, David Hoganson trained as an engineer before uh, medical school. And so he uh, is a unique resource really with uh, uh, clinical experience as well as uh, engineering understanding of, of problem solving. And he's built uh, a big team uh, there are six of us currently with more on the way, uh, including uh, my colleague Vijay Govindarajan, who's a computational fluid dynamics expert uh, in cardiac modeling, uh, myself, and uh, a couple of other mechanical engineers, Emily Eikhoff and Nick Nyer, who are both um, working with us on cardiac modeling, as well as uh, device development and the other tasks that we've been given. Um, but our team is uh, really uh, moving very quickly from what started out when I joined the lab a couple of years ago as a research project that, you know, I thought, oh, great, this is, <laughs> what may, you know, may work life balance, maybe it will improve, but it turned very quickly into a clinical service. I think uh, our zero distance approach, uh, which pairs uh, engineers with clinicians very closely and puts engineers right in the rooms where clinical decisions are being made. We attend clinical uh, conferences every Tuesday morning, and we attend many other meetings that are discussing patient care and where decisions about patient care are being made. And I think what's happened is that the clinicians recognize that they have an engineering resource right in the room uh, who, you know, the team bringing an understanding of engineering and the applications to these kinds of problems that, you know, are, are fundamentally ones that can be approached from an engineering perspective. Uh, and what we've turned into is essentially a consulting service uh, to assist clinicians in decision making and procedure planning across the heart center. The basis for all of our work is anatomical modeling from patient imaging. So we aren't necessarily requesting imaging being made specifically for our purposes, but uh, the clinical imaging that's used for diagnostic purposes actually works quite well for 
individual anatomical modeling. And fundamentally, what we are doing is building individual patient-specific models for individual patient-specific decision-making. Uh, congenital heart defects are various, and the anatomical differences from patient to patient, even with similar uh, diagnoses, can be really large. And so these are unique patients, really unique needs, and uh, a broader modeling program may find it difficult to match a more generic model to a specific patient. So we are building directly in the clinical timeframe models for patient diagnostic and planning use for specific patients. Um, this uh, image just shows a already clinically available uh, visualization tool, but we find it kind of limiting and our process just uses this as essentially the starting block for, uh, for a larger construction process. And this is generally what the workflow looks like. Again, I said it starts with patient imaging and we use CT or MRI imaging to build a model. That 3D anatomic model can be used for a number of things. Uh, planning reconstruction approaches with surgeons essentially as another visual aid that allows them to interrogate the anatomy in a novel way and sometimes in a more intuitive way uh, in VR, in you know what we sort of call two and a half D, uh, 3D visualization on a traditional 2D uh, display or using some of the holographic displays and glasses-free 3D displays that are coming online. Uh, these can be used for geometric planning of patches or uh, essentially repair planning by looking at the interior, you know, internal intracardiac anatomy. Surgeons are able to get a better idea of what these flow pathways from the heart out into the great vessels uh, actually look. And we're able to make some plans uh, well before the patient is even in the hospital. Uh, and we found that these models move directly into the operating room. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but we're building 3D digital tools for interoperative guidance. And that's become a very large part of the work that we do. And all of these things can end up directly in the OR in a relatively short clinical time frame. Uh, we've made cardiac models that are used in the OR in as little as a few hours, depending on the case. We usually like to have a little more time than that, but we're not always uh, we're not always so lucky since we work in a again very high stakes uh, clinical environment. Just to give you an idea of where things start, again, this is anatomical modeling. This is a product called uh, Mimics for Materialize that's a commonly used FDA approved uh, segmentation software for building uh, the substrate, the modeling substrate of the existing anatomy from the patient. Uh, you can see here just sort of scrolling through uh, CT here and segmenting out the uh, cardiac anatomy into segments that we can look at and interrogate individually that build up into the uh, patient's cardiac model. For many years, uh, since 2014, I have been 3D printing these models. So once a digital model was built, uh, I spent quite a long time uh, starting with rigid models uh, held together by magnets to more sophisticated elastomeric models like the one you see here, uh, which were then brought to the surgeon uh, a few days before the surgery, and they could cut them open and essentially do virtual or rehearsed procedures on them. Uh, they're suturable and uh, easily manipulated. There are downsides to that as well. Uh, 3D printing is expensive, and it fails a lot particularly elastomeric materials are hard to print and uh, take quite a lot of time. And our frames don't necessarily allow for us to wait 24 hours for a high resolution cardiac model to be printed and post process. And we found the digital models to be much more flexible. Uh, they measure twice, cut once rules that we might apply uh, for a carpentry project don't necessarily hold up when you've got a cardiac model that takes 36 hours to print and costs, you know, thousands of dollars. It's very difficult to uh, make a second cut and uh, and do that in a in a clinical clinically relevant time. But these digital models are very easy to cut and extremely easy to put back together. So you can see on the right side, this is a cardiac model that was used. Um, this is a web-based visualization tool, uh, a commercial product 
that we use pretty regularly that the surgeons have access to, and they're able to make as many incisions and uh, changes to the models they want in that environment. And again, this is you know strictly uh, patient modeling. This is existing anatomy uh, being shown right now, but we're able to use these same tools to uh, do some planning as well. Just to give you an idea of the volume. It's a sort of very basic clinical dashboard uh, of our work over the last couple of years. In 2018, we had two requests for cardiac models. You can see it went up quite a lot in 2019. And uh, as of this point in 2020, I probably have to add a couple of more uh, pieces for the 2020 bar graph there. I think we're at 115 or 116 cases delivered over the last couple of years. And again, these models are produced in a very, uh, generally very short clinical timeline. Um, for anatomical modeling, uh, we do some more advanced modeling that I'll get to that takes a little bit longer, but we're able to, we've never missed a uh, surgical deadline uh, over the last couple of years. And myself and uh, Emily Eikhoff are the prelim, uh, primary engineers building these cardiac models. And as I said, these go directly into the operating room. Uh, I've spent quite a lot of time uh, just outside the surgical field in the OR, manipulating models and uh, making digital measurements all, uh, on models at the surgeon's request, uh, essentially to help them navigate the anatomy as they do the surgery. So they may be doing quite a lot of surgical planning, but uh, things may look a little different when the heart is deflated and empty, and they may be asking for uh, dimensions of a, of a defect or the distance between two vessels. And that's actually become quite common. Uh, although in the days of uh, COVID uh, work from home, we're doing this completely over the web. I've got a, the ability to view the surgeon's head cam uh, from home over the, you know, using a secure channel and essentially doing a Zoom session into the OR where I'm able to manipulate the model and make measurements while the surgeon is working. Uh, you know, in the in the middle of the case, which is uh, it, it's really expanded our ability to continue to provide the kinds of services that we have been in person um, much more easily, even though we're working remotely. We can do more with the anatomical model. As I said, it's a substrate for uh, what can become much more advanced than just additional visualization. This is uh, some planning that we did for. Uh, catheter-based intervention for a patient whose uh, Fontan conduit, which is a, a single ventricle palliation uh, surgery, uh, which essentially creates a passive flow from the lower body to the lungs. And this patient was really struggling and needed an intervention to simplify the flow. And we were able to use uh, our digital models to essentially build a uh, visualizations as well as CFD, computational fluid dynamics models of the anatomy to start uh, testing uh, potential interventions. And so what you're seeing here, this plays appropriately, there we go. Uh, these are uh, CFD analysis of flow. Uh, the existing anatomy is shown on the left side and a potential surgical intervention is shown in the middle in uh, and still digital models just showing the anatomical changes and uh, the CFD analysis uh, showing the streamlines and flow. You can see on the left, there's quite a lot of uh, turbulent flow happening in this very large uh, right atrium. And then the simplified intervention with a much narrower Fontan conduit uh, shows much smoother flow. And we were uh, able to uh, take this a bit further in this case, we didn't do this one in a week, by the way, this, this took a bit longer, but we're able to take the, uh, the surgical plan suggestion and using some tools from Dassault, uh, which is uh, a wonderful part of our partnership and uh, collaboration with them, able to develop a method for building templates for these complex patches you can see on the left side, this is uh, the anatomy essentially being unwrapped. These anatomical changes that are done in the in the operating room 
uh, use uh, several materials that are generally flat to make complex 3D shapes. And so what we were able to do is design the shape to optimize flow and then essentially unwrap it and provide a relatively detailed template to use as a reference in the operating room. So the surgeon was able to reconstruct, and you can see there's a paper model here on the right side, <laughs> a little uh, proof of concept. Uh, but this template on the upper right was actually brought into the OR to use as a reference while this surgery was happening and the patients had a really excellent result. And these decisions are commonly made in the operating room with really very little a priori knowledge. And particularly for the kinds of cases that are seen at Children's Hospital where patients have very unusual anatomy and are really looking for uh, a, you know, a, a really uh, high intensity intervention, we've found that these tools can be extremely useful in allowing surgeons to do quite a lot of the planning and decision making beforehand. And I think that's why we've seen such a, a response from the clinical teams. Um, I know this is a VR talk and I haven't really gotten to VR yet, but uh, <laughs> we're very interested in VR <laughs> and we're doing a little bit of it here and there. Uh, this is an anatomical model that was requested by a surgeon. Uh, Dr. Hoganson's experiencing it there in the, in the Oculus. And we've done some exploration of this and we think that it, there's quite a lot of value in it, both for surgical planning and anatomical understanding, as well as education, both for patients, as well as for new physicians. Uh, you know, this is an unusual, um, these anatomies are very unusual and there is not necessarily a good representation of a particular patient's complex anatomy available. And these are ways that we're able to share some of this and give a new understanding uh, and a visual understanding of uh, really complex relationships between uh, these cardiac anatomies that are really very difficult to understand in 2D. And here you can see this is a, a shot from the surgeon's head cam just finishing uh, suturing that unfolded patch that you saw uh, in a couple of slides earlier. And again, I was able to uh, observe this case remotely and uh, make measurements and, and uh, record things. And we're able to provide a level of detail that surgeons are essentially usually forced to reconstruct in their, uh, in their own heads. <laughs> And, and as I said, we're using these for education. This is uh, a parent of a child who was uh, in preoperative uh, care, getting ready for a surgery. And the, uh, the father was able to actually interrogate a model that represented his child's uh, diagnosis and was really able to understand. I think, you know, we expect that, that patients and their families are going to be able to make really critical clinical decisions with uh, uh, without really a detailed understanding of anatomy. And I think what, what we found and what excites us too about the Living Heart Project is that these models and these uh, representations of anatomy can be incredibly useful in explaining what are you know, essentially very complex uh, and unique anatomical structures in a way that's, uh, in a way that's approachable and really intuitive. And I think we've had a couple of opportunities to share this with uh, patients and families, and those uh, have been very positive. And I think we're very excited to continue to explore that, uh, both using uh, 2D, 3D, and VR and XR um, modalities. You can see in the middle, this is a plastic heart model that uh, Dr. Hoganson carries around in his jacket pocket. And this is generally the way that he explains uh, the patient anatomy to parent, uh, to children and parents. And uh, it's a normal anatomy heart and it doesn't have any of the common uh, defects that we are generally trying to repair. So I think uh, there are you know, great limitations in that kind of a fixed model. And on the right here, you can see just a few of the uh, anatomical models that we've built that allow for a, an enormous wide variety of anatomies to, uh, to be shared. And these are all patient-specific models. 
Uh, and we make quite a lot of them. As I said, we have several hundred now uh, from the last six years of anatomical modeling work uh, to use as a reference library, but we're continuing to make these patient-specific models, both for better understanding of patients and families, uh, as well as the, excuse me, as well as the clinical teams. And uh, I'm gonna end on a silly picture here, but we're really interested in technology. And I think we're not, uh, not to sit on our laurels. You know, I think in 2014, my colleagues thought that 3D printing was going to be the, uh, the answer to anatomical modeling questions. And I think we've very quickly in the last few years realized that it has a place, but it's not, uh, it's not the, the perfect solution to the problem. And I think we're excited about VR and the potential for that. But I think, you know, as part of this community and, and you know, I think this is a good opportunity to say what's after VR <laughs> um, when we when we get to the limits of that. But I think we're, we're still very much exploring the edges of it and we're excited to uh, and uh, with that, I'm going to kick it back to Stephen. Great. Thanks, Noah. I think um, <clears throat> uh, I'm sure everyone um, was totally blown away to see the kind of progress you've been able to make. And, and I'm sure you've opened their minds into thinking really what's, um, what's really on the horizon. And so uh, just to quickly wrap up, uh, you know, I invite you all to learn a little bit more about the Living Heart Project. This is kind of a summary slide. Uh, we're really excited about uh, the way we've sort of crowdsourced science. We're keeping uh, what I believe is the best of the system we have in place, um, where people are able to independently do the best science, publish, uh, but share results, not just through the printed word, but actually augment that with physical 3D models that, that others can then immediately implement their advances and, um, and test them out for their usage. Um, and that has really accelerated our ability uh, to really push this technology forward. Uh, in the left hand, bottom left hand corner, you can see how the project has grown, kind of organically grown from a handful of people that uh, got on board back then and every year it just keeps growing and growing. Uh, we now have, uh, I don't know, 145 different organizations all across the world. We're, I think we're in 28 countries now. Um, and so we have this common representation for human anatomy that's shared amongst all of these countries and facilities. And I think that's a really, to me, uh, a real breakthrough in terms of the way we do science. Uh, in the middle here, you see the timeline. Um, probably the most exciting part is using this model, we've been able to do this amazingly quickly. We, that first model that we, uh, that I talked about, we went from the launch of the project to having that model commercially available. So commercial grade piece of software in one year. Um, and since then we've now advanced it. It's an enterprise system. It's available on the cloud. It's available to all the members and we can do all these solutions. The real heroes, uh, I've presented a lot of work here. Uh, we're the uh, Let me organization. Check. I'm sorry, can you share your screen? Because I don't think we're seeing the slides. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I missed a... Thank you. Okay. I was one click behind. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll go, I'm not gonna say that again. Um, but you have all the information you can go back through um, and take a look at it. You'll be able to, oh, by the way, get the slides. Uh, so don't feel like you have to copy down anything now. I'll share all this information. Uh, thanks, Oceana, for pointing that out. So the real heroes, as I was saying, uh, are the members. Um, these are the people who share their expertise, their knowledge, uh, but utilize it. They share a piece of it, their expertise. Uh, in their one particular area and we're able to provide it back to them in the context of an entire fully functioning human heart. Um, and that has really been pretty uh, amazingly effective. They're able to publish all this work and share all the information. And, um, and as you can see, we set out to get representatives from the four different communities, research, industry, uh, clinical, and um, uh, and, and the regulatory, and uh, we've been very successful. 
and happy to see that. Uh, since this is a very visual group, uh, I thought I'd share this slide. One of the fun things about, you know, know that this will come across in, in the Zoom. Uh, looks like it's frozen. One of the things that um, is exciting about being able to use this sort of model is that people take the same heart model and represent it in many different ways. Um, and so these, these are all uh, virtual reality, augmented reality uh, representations of the heart model. I think the video is not, uh, not playing. I'll just jump ahead. And as uh, Noah pointed out, this is really excellent for education. We're taking it out into schools, uh, STEM events. Uh, one of the things we found is that by representing an entire heart model in virtual reality, uh, you know, grade school children can understand that computers are not just for games, but actually for interesting science. And so I encourage you all to go to 3ds.com slash heart. You can find all this information, videos, technical publications, et cetera. Uh, and of course, with the success we've had uh, with the heart model, we didn't haven't stopped there. We've been systematically working uh, to represent more and more of the body. So you can actually um, ultimately study more, more human anatomy in a realistic environment. Uh, the living brain, uh, as a lot of you might appreciate, this is a particularly big challenge, but we've been uh, already fairly successful in extending this model to be able to study traumatic brain injury, deep brain stimulation, actually studying neurodegenerative diseases using many of the same methodologies and expanding them. And so we're pretty optimistic. And from my, back to my company's perspective, uh, as you said, we have a long legacy of helping industries go, really uh, navigate through digital transformation. Uh, with this success, we've actually now made a full commitment to try to do this for the human body, to bring this digital human to life. Um, and so if you're at all interested in helping with any body part, um, by all means, contact me and we'd love to help uh, you work with us to develop a digital twin to help uh, doctors like Dr. Hoganson do their work. So with that, I'd like to open the floor up for Q&A. Yeah, thank you so much for an amazing presentation and all this content is, content is like you said, um, so forward and there's so much potential. We have a lot of questions. Um, I will start with uh, you, Steve. Um, there's a question from the audience. Um, are the living heart models publicly available is one of the questions. Great. Uh, so yes, uh, as I mentioned, the, the way that uh, I've chosen to make the product uh, the heart models available is through the project so that we can really uh, support this uh, collaborative accumulation of knowledge rather than kind of have the model go off and go into the dark recesses and go back to the world where everything was fragmented. Uh, I know one day that will happen, but I think we're still in that up in the still in the building phase. So by joining the project, which costs you nothing, um, you can make access to it, but I wanna create a one-to-one -one relationship with you. So I know what you're doing uh, and I can help you be successful. And then if you're doing something novel that we've never seen, then we make sure that we bring that uh, information back and make the model better. Uh, and, and of course, um, if you're not interested in that kind of working, um, we're a software company and, and you're uh, more than welcome to purchase the model and use it for your own developments, et cetera. Now, um... We understand that everyone's heart is different and how can the living heart be used to represent real patients and what kind of diseases can be simulated? Well, uh, fantastic question. And I think uh, some of those answers you started to see uh, through Noah's presentation, Dr. Hogenson, is that we're creating kind of the foundational uh, model to represent the heart. Uh, we kind of use the methodology, say, that um, the Human Genome Project used, that you know, we are more alike than we are different. So let's capture how we are alike and then have people like Noah and his team uh, make the modifications if you have a defect, if you have heart disease, so you change only those pieces that are needed to create that patient-specific part. And so you don't have to create everything from scratch. 
you get 80, 90, 95% of the way already there because essentially human anatomy is pretty common. And, and so, um, and, and again, the work that the clinicians and folks at Boston Children's Hospital are teaching us how to make those modifications and, um, and, and of course, um, sharing it as much as we can. Yeah, that's been a really enriching part of the partnership uh, and our membership in the LHB is the, uh, the work has been, you know, we've jumped in and saw places where we could, uh, where we could help uh, with our experience in, in anatomical defects and uh, understanding of certain structures. And, uh, and we've, you know, again, it, it, you know, it's, it's paid us back directly with, uh, you know, these models that are just unparalleled in being able to explain uh, patient anatomy and, and particularly a couple of defects models that were, that were currently in, pro in progress uh, developing that have been hugely uh, helpful in, in sharing with patients and families and just developing a better understanding of their own disease. So it's, a, it's an incredibly fruitful uh, relationship and it's a great, uh, it's a great group uh, all across the world. There, there are collaborators uh, working on really interesting things and, and partnerships developing for us, which has really uh, been a huge thing. Yeah. The other piece that of course uh, we all know is that by, by comparing a, a a given patient against, uh, you know, kind of a reference, a healthy reference, you get this differential diagnosis, uh, which, you know, sometimes can be the most efficient way to do it, to understand, to zero in on what's different. And then the clinician can immediately apply uh, their intuition to understand, well, if that's what's happening now, I know how to, how to treat it. Um, and so there's ways to, to actually use it without um, going through that effort and actually just do that diagnosis. And so again, I think there's lots of modes that we're starting to see, uh, given the creativity of all these people that are that are now able to try it. Now, um, some long-term implications of a disease or, or a treatment, for example, for COVID-19, can be um, hard to address. And can modeling and simulation help with that? Uh, well, certainly. Uh, you know, these virtual patients uh, don't mind if we accelerate their aging process, which is good. Um, uh, we have to understand the phenomena that is, is associated with the aging uh, capability. But again, I think this is really probably the best uh, vehicle we have to look at um, the long-term effects. As we know, particularly in things like clinical trials, you can only go out so much time. Um, and then the rest is found out in the real world. And then revisions happen and whatnot. And so uh, I think as we change our focus in the clinical capture of knowledge from just capturing the knowledge purely for treating the patient to this accumulation of knowledge so that as we learn uh, about the aging process of each of these organs, and COVID-19 is a great example, we're beginning to understand, for example, about the cardiomyopathy and et cetera, and, and uh, certainly makes me wonder what will happen to all those patients that um, have survived the virus but have suffered some damage and being able to understand that I think um, we'll be able to capture that knowledge and then start to do these accelerated aging studies. So I think um, that's probably one of the areas that I'll be turning my attention to next year. Yeah I'm certainly also after COVID goes away uh, we'll definitely continue to have indications. Um, there's one question that was directly directed to you, Stephen, and it says, um, I'm currently with a med device company and we use Abacus quite extensively for device evaluation. We're looking for the best path forward to using and incorporating the Live in Hartford device evaluations. We're interested in any thoughts you might have on or roadmap to at least get the ball rolling. Uh, well, probably uh, very happy to do that. It's um, part of my day job. Uh, so uh, more than happy to do that. Uh, probably, well, so the simple answer is that, that the Living Heart model is based on the same uh, computational foundation, the Abacus computational foundation as you're using today. There's no difference. Uh, that was one of our key goals so that you didn't have this super special version that you could only use. It just, if you got the heart tomorrow, you could start using it on Monday. So, um, so rather than take the entire community through the details, uh, be probably best to follow up with you independently. 
um, happy to help you through that process. And there's some questions for um, Noah. Do you find immediate demand after clinicians see your work? And when, or when clinicians see the potential for improved outcome or value and how does your team manage this if it happens? It happens. <laughs> we, like I said, we went from two models to, you know, 33 in the first year and it was just me. Uh, we do hiring, that is a thing. Uh, and we are actually, if you know anybody, um, <laughs> get in touch. We are currently, I'm about to post a job for someone with expertise in Unity or Unreal Engine and uh, an interest in VR visualization uh, to essentially work in the clinical space and uh, help integrate visualization tools across a number of, excuse me, clinical uh, departments, essentially through the catheterization lab, the uh, electrophysiology lab and the ORs. Um, one of the ways that we do that, uh, you know, one of, the <laughs> one of the ways that we do it is by creating these things, gauging the level of interest. And when clinicians come to us and say, hey, we need more of this and we need it faster, we say, okay, uh, that costs money. You might need to find a, a line item for us to add additional resources. Um, it's a relatively specialized field and, uh, you know, it took me quite a while to get the level of um, understanding of anatomy so that I could produce these things in, in clinical timeframes so, that, you know, it, it, it can be very difficult to understand the anatomy for a seasoned clinician. It's another thing for an engineer with uh, without an MD to <laughs> wade through uh, patient modeling on a Sunday morning and try to get something meaningful for Monday. But um, that, you know, we've, like I said, we haven't missed a clinical deadline. Um, and that is, you know, it's a, it's a large level of effort. But what we found is the, the immediacy with the communication between clinicians and engineers, this zero distance philosophy that we've been following allows us to really easily um, communicate with surgeons and find their pain points essentially and look for the things that we think our engineering tools will be able to help with most effectively. And when we find something like that, the collaboration is, is fast and intense and uh, revisions come quickly and uh, understanding on, I think on both sides grows. And um, we, you know, we're seeing, a, uh, we're seeing a, a very large level of interest among the surgeons at Boston Children's and, and elsewhere, honestly, we've done a couple of models for outside institutions and we are in the process of, um, of uh, planning for ways to share our expertise and to help build um, programs at other institutions, because I think this has huge value, um, not only for, you know, a few surgeons at one institution, but broadly for, um, for healthcare and for cardiac surgeons and, and uh, cardiologists around the world. And I think we're, we're very interested in, in helping to build programs that, that can support this kind of work um, in whatever form that takes. But again, uh, if, uh, <laughs> if you know Unity and you don't uh, mind seeing blood, uh, get in touch with me because we're, we're very interested in expanding our team and, and our, the interest has just been enormous. Noah, how much time does it take to build a physical moment mo model of the patient's heart from a CAT scan or MRI? It's highly dependent on the imaging. Uh, high quality 3D volumetric imaging is really key. And uh, whether that's a CT or an MRI, um, the, the quality of the imaging really has an effect on both the ultimate quality of model, but the amount of time that it takes. With a very high quality MRI and uh, a sort of baseline anatomical model without uh, planned surgical interventions, uh, we can generally make one in a few hours. Um, we have tried to speed that up and there have been research projects for using uh, artificial intelligence or neural networks to do automated segmentation. Automated segmentation tools work well for adult uh, imaging where it's a relatively normal anatomy and the interest is in looking at, you know, a pathway to a specific spot uh, for a specific kind of procedure. For the anatomical uh, variation that we see in the pediatric patients, it can be very hard. Um, and those tools have a tendency not to work all that well. But, uh, you know, generally, a few hours to a day, depending on the quality of imaging for a single engineer to create a model with, you know, multiple components and, and uh, you know, a relatively 
reliable uh, anatomical representation. Impressive. And, and if your initial focus of VR is for intracranial, uh, intracardiac planning, what structures inside the heart are you most interested in seeing for pre-op planning? So what we've seen, you know, a particular uh, area of focus for us has been um, VSDs, a, a very specific defect called um, double right ventricle, where both right vessels come out of the right ventricle. You're breaking um, we can't hear you very well. Oh, sorry. Is that a little better? Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. I hope. Okay. Um, there were there were a, a few specific uh, diagnoses that I think have been the most interesting in terms of geometric reconstruction. Uh, double outlet right ventricle is a condition that um, involves the great vessels both coming off of the right ventricle instead of the aorta from the left and the PA coming from the right. And this is a complex reconstruction that's generally planned and, and, uh, and created right in the operating room by the surgeon during the procedure. Um, and what we found is there's great value in a 3D representation to um, help plan these patches that are uh, essentially sewn in to redirect flow from the left ventricle into the aorta. Um, and that's a place that we spent We've spent quite a while working on um, that problem and sort of coming up with ways to create visualizations and tools to assist in that kind of planning. Um, those kinds of defects are not necessarily hard to see in the traditional 2D views that you get from a CT or MRI. However, they generally don't sit uh, in a planar position that ever really shows up clearly in any one of the three views. So, uh, you know, they're complex curving structures and they can be very difficult to understand, you know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis their relationship with the great vessels. And uh, so these 3D models have really allowed surgeons to really visualize what the effects are of going, are going to be of closing, uh, closing a, a defect or redirecting flow. And that's been an extremely useful uh, case. That's, that's something that we focused on for several years now. Thank you. And I think for the interest of time, we'll just take one more question. Um, no, for Noah, it was, uh, it was really eye-opening to see the, the clinical, current clinical workflow that your team does with patient-specific 3D models. Um, do you anticipate being able to integrate VR visualization this, into the same workflow and create a large number of patient-specific hearts on a VR platform? I hope so. <laughs> but that, you know, our ultimately our goal is is to take these anatomical models that we've built and build a library in VR as a reference point for education, for planning, and uh, and for modeling. You know, and I think as we, you know, our lab has a focus on device development as well. Um, you know, it's an opportunity for us to talk about. Uh, building a patient population with specific defects that we can use uh, as a reference point for device development. Um, we are really interested in visualization of all kinds. Uh, I can't, I, I don't think I'm going to be allowed to put a VR headset on a surgeon in the OR. I think that's probably uh, not going to be, not gonna go over well, but we're looking at other 3D visualization uh, tools like glasses free displays that will allow us to um, and, and hands-free control using things like leap motion or uh, other gesture recognition uh, systems to allow clinicians to manipulate these things. I want the surgeon to be able to look and interrogate a model in the operating room uh, while they're in the case without having to scrub out. And uh, that's something that we're actively working on. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think that uh, we, I don't think we found the, found the answer yet necessarily in terms of the best way to share these uh, big and very important data sets. But I think VR is going to play a big role, both outside of the OR and you know, potentially in the OR in certain ways. Certainly, certainly. Well, we all th we thank you both um, for this incredible presentation and all the data sharing. Thank you so much. And thank you for the audience for attending. You, if you wanna continue the discussion, if you've seen the chat has been going on, uh, please join the 
um, Slack channel. There's a Slack channel. It's in the chat. You probably can see it. Um, it's the bit.ly slash VR Slack. So we continue the discussion there and answer any questions or and join MedVR or any collaborations you'd like to have. Thank you both. Thank you all. And hope to see you on our next um, VR event. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.